The name's Bond. James Bond. Hey guys, it's Quinn. After 15 years at the helm, Daniel Craig has wrapped up his tenure as 007 in the 2021 film No Time to Die. With it came the end of not only the longest, but perhaps most controversial Bond actor tenure in the history of the franchise. Many fans heralded his performance as the most stoic since Connery, the most serious since Dalton's. Others have begrudged him for taking the part a little too seriously, pointing to people like Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan as actors who struck the balance a little bit more successfully. Then of course you have your lazenby dogmatists who will always be down for a good fight. Well, today we will settle the score. Today we will be taking a look at the ranking of each James Bond actor, worst to best. To start, this is my personal ranking. It is subjective in nature, so if your personal favorite ends up higher or lower on my list than you would have hoped for, please be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below and I'd be happy to discuss. Further, if you wish to see more James Bond and film content, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button below. Without further ado, here it is, the James Bond actors, worst to best. Number 6, George Lazenby. Lazenby is the punching bag of the fandom, due in part to his subpar acting abilities, but more so for his relative irrelevance writ large. For all of his deserving criticism, I will say I do have a sweet spot for Lazenby, which we'll get to. The one-time Bond actor and star of Honor Majesty's Secret Service falls at the bottom of our list simply because he had no real opportunity to prove himself otherwise. It is almost impossible to move up if you only have one film under your belt, so I'm happy to keep him at the bottom spot as well, which is pretty consistent with other rankings that you will see. We all know the criticism, so I'm not going to beat up on him too much. Simply put, he's wooden and could never escape the shadow of Sean Connery. Simple enough. However, I wish to use this opportunity to defend the man just a little bit. Honor Matches Secret Service is one of the best films in the series, and I think part of this has to be attributed to Lazenby. His love and eventual marriage with Tracy, the Bond girl of the film, is sold successfully by Lazenby. I think a lot of this is attributable to the fact that he is you know, not some larger-than-life presence like Connery was, but rather a man you know, who sort of had the ability to feel. His physicality is equal to that of any other, other Bonds, maybe besides you know, Daniel Craig, and his final scene with Tracy is kind of just a beautiful moment. Ultimately, though, defending Lazenby is a fruitless task. He's going to be six on everyone's list, and the same will be true here. Number five, Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton is excellent, and I think it is undeniable that he matches most closely to the Ian Fleming novels. Indeed, in his ability to play the role seriously, I think he does the best job of any actor in the series. Dalton, unfortunately, suffers much from the same issues as that of Lazenby. Because he only got two films in the Living Daylights and License to Kill, he simply did not have enough films to spread his wings. Do not get me wrong, I think Dalton does a fantastic job as the hard-nosed agent, but because he only got two films, he is given no ability to demonstrate any amount of versatility. For some, this is fine. They enjoy watching The Cold-Hearted Killer. However, for me, I wish to see some sort of juxtaposition. I want some sort of charm, some sort of humor, some sort of romance. Dalton's performance lacks in these departments. Of course, he was not really intending to do any of this, nor was his character given these attributes in either of these films in a really meaningful way. So we can pin his performance on both his personal decisions as well as the script he was given, rather than any sort of lack of acting ability. Dalton is a fantastic actor. I'm sure if he wanted to play it silly, he easily could have. I mean, look at Hot Fuzz. It was many years later, but he absolutely pours it on in this film. So we know he can do it. But for what I want in a Bond, there's simply more to be offered elsewhere. Unlike Lazenby, who gave an average performance, Dalton did fantastic with the direction he wanted to take the character. But the rigidity of his character, it just leaves something to be desired for me. Although I think he played the serious part better than anyone else in the series, and if you want serious, you get it in Dalton, his lack of films and the lack of where he took the character, it's not what I wanted. And I think that the only reason he is number five instead of number four is because number four, frankly, just had more films to do it in. Number four, Daniel Craig. 
Daniel Craig is Timothy Dalton if Timothy Dalton got five Bond outings instead of two. His character, however, was allowed to grow a little bit in those subsequent films. And by his final Bond outing, you could see an absolute comfort in the role, which we hadn't really seen probably since The World Is Not Enough with Pierce Brosnan over 20 years prior. I know many fans, especially newer Bond fans, consider Craig to be the best in the series. To be honest, I do think this is due to two factors. One, his Bond is given the most to do, and two, I think there's recency bias, so let's talk about both of them. Craig, of course, is given huge performative range, especially in Spectre and No Time to Die. However, I never fully bought that him and Madeline Swan, who's the main Bond girl in both of those films, fall in love. Without spoiling anything about those two films, the plot of each hinges really hard on Bond's unwavering affection towards this Bond girl. However, I just don't really buy it. A lot of this, you know, most of it really is due to writing, and I don't think the characters are given a chance to gel because of the writing, but I think that that is a flaw with Craig's Bond, and because so much of his character depends on that relationship, I think it's almost an unforgivable sin with his performance. And then of course there's recency bias. You know, let's be honest here, he is very similar to Dalton. However, Dalton is never really talked about outside of the fandom because it's been over 30 years at this point since he last donned the suit. If their times were swapped, so Craig was in the 80s, Dalton was now, I don't think Craig would have the universal praise he receives currently. Of course, there is much to like. He is very physical. He is an incredibly believable agent. His action sequences are phenomenal. And he is a brilliant actor with the ability to pull off the romantic sequences well. We saw that in Casino Royale quite clearly. However, I don't find him overly charming compared to other Bond actors. And because his films depend so heavily on romance, later in, this, later in his tenure with No Time to Die especially, which I find not believable, I think his Bond legacy has a slight divot in it. Number three, Roger Moore. Look, I'll say it off the bat, the man with the golden gun is probably the single worst Bond performance in the series. He is uncharming in that role, a dick for no reason, and doesn't do much in the way of action. Further, he is too old in a view to a kill, in what was otherwise I think a very fun performance. So why is Roger Moore ahead of the mighty Daniel Craig? Simply put, Roger Moore's Bond is fun. He's funny, and damn it, he could charm over the head of the Soviets himself, which he seemingly does in half of his films. Roger Moore films are goofy delights, and he sells them perfectly. He brings the escapism aspect of the series in a way that I don't think any other actor before or since has quite mastered. He's probably the least serious physical threat, but his Bond doesn't demand that. Instead, he brings a lofty energy to his films. Granted, I understand this comes down to personal preference. People don't like Roger Moore because he is quote-unquote goofy. But for me, his entire goal was to bring the fun. And for my money, I like the fact that the actor embraced his own personality and let it breathe on screen in such an exciting fashion. Look no further than a film such as Octopussy for how this performance breathed life into a film which, without his performance, easily could have been unsuccessful and a tonal abomination. Number two, Sean Connery. To start, if this were an objective list, Connery would be number one, no doubt. When people say James Bond, Connery comes to mind. The 60s swagger, the 60s cool, are personified by Sean Connery throughout his performances. Besides maybe JFK himself, it's hard to imagine a man who better personified the era. And from Dr. No to Thunderball, Connery's performance brought this to the screen in timeless fashion. Connery's performance in Thunderball is my personal favorite Bond actor performance in the entire series. The escapism that he brings is amazing. His action fights are brutal. His charm with every character is melting. He's hilarious. And even when he faces certain death in, like, every scene, his Montana cool is off the charts. Bond's character is supposed to be one that every man wants to be and every woman wants to be with. And if you don't feel that after seeing Connery's performance in Thunderball, then the series just isn't for you. And I don't even really like Thunderball as a film! 
Thunderball, of course, is a culmination of progressively better performances from Dr. No to From Rush With Love to Goldfinger. In each film, he pours it on in better and better fashion. These performances are timeless. Why then is he not number one? Very simply put, I think the performances stagnate in You Only Live Twice and finally take a clear nosedive in his final film, Diamonds Are Forever. In Diamonds, it's clear he's there for a paycheck. You will never find someone who thinks Connery's performance in Diamonds is better than that of Goldfinger, even. And the reason is, is because he just doesn't put in an effort in his final run. If Connery stopped after Thunderball, he would be my number one pick. But a phone-in job is something I personally just can't get behind, unlike our number one pick. Number one, Pierce Brosnan. Star of four Bond films, Brosnan combined the swagger of Connery and the affability of Moore into what I believe to be the perfect Bond performance. Charming yet cold-hearted, hilarious yet ready for some sort of brutal fight sequence, Brosnan brought a longevity to the role after the end of the Dalton era and Cold War, which I believe has allowed the series to continue with prominence to this day. Of course I am biased, Brosnan was my first Bond so will always hold a place in my heart, but I believe that he combined the best attributes of each actor without their faults. Even in the ridiculous Die Another Day, Brosnan did not phone it in. He never abandoned his personality like Moore did in The Man with the Golden Gun. He was given the chance to be more dynamic than Dalton did, and he sold relationships better than Craig did. And of course, he's just a better actor than Lazenby is. Whatever you enjoy about the other actors, I think it can be found in Brosnan. Combine this flexibility with the multitude of characters involved in his films that he has to work with, and you lead to my favorite performance in the entire series. So what do you think? Am I a lunatic for putting Roger Moore above Daniel Craig? Does Pierce Brosnan deserve the top spot? Let me know what your ranking is in the comments section below. I'm always curious to see how people view the different Bond actors, especially after a tenure ends. So let me know in the comments section below, and as always, like, share, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this content, and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao.